Okay, good morning to everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to chair this last session of the University Impact Forum. I think that this is a really good opportunity to learn from different perspectives on how we can transform our societies uh, concretely and specifically in our case, in the case of University of Deusto, we are now developing our strategic uh, uh, development plan, which is very focused on how we can transform our world. And so to, to share our experiences on how we are working with different uh, actors in society, firms, public institutions, but even uh, civil society and social organization, which is the aim of this last panel, is a, an issue, a key issue for us in order to foster also the SDG 16 aim, which is peace and, and justice. So uh, it's a pleasure to have this panel for this uh, today, this morning. In this last panel of the day, we will discuss this university society interaction and the tasks and targets to achieve that must be shared. We will reflect on issues or questions such as the best existing collaboration strategies among the universities, academics and the social entities or civil society, but also how effectively we can structure the relationship. We can do it through networks, platforms and so on, and which kind of institutions we need to create also to, to develop in a more effective way this interaction among the academic and the society, and how we can, can we build collaboration with teaching and research in environments that are difficult or with difficult or no access to higher education, because, because we are thinking in a global context also. So how we can facilitate also the involvement of civil society in those less developed uh, territories, regions in the world in order to, to have more equal equal war, more justice, and so on. So we have a very diverse and rich perspectives in our panel today, uh, both geographically, but also uh, they have a very different background on their role on how they are contributing to, to this engagement. We have uh, Sean Even is pro, pro vice Chancellor to develop strategies for indigenous communities inclusion at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, we have also Maria do Rosario, Lopez Pereira Concalves, president of Econnect, which is the network of electoral commissions of the European of the Economic Community of West African States, and she's also involved in how generate an act active involvement of women in society, which is a key issue in the world, but especially in West Africa. And Dan Plech, uh, is the director of the Center for International Studies at SOAS, University of London, which is the, one of the best universities in developing international impact, in international studies and in, in global impact through their development programs. So, as you can see, they come from different, very different geographies, very different backgrounds, uh, working with indigenous communities, with active participation of women and electoral uh, demography and democracy and issues, and also how to ha have a more in a global impact in the world. So we will start the session with an initial statement of each of you and in order to introduce your context, but also your experience and your role on how you are working on this interaction among the academic world and the civil society. Sean? Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And um, given the diversity of the panel, I hope we can find some um, coherent streams to, to talk about. Okay. Uh, can I begin, as, as we would uh, have custom in Australia, in acknowledging uh, the Basque people, the indigenous peoples of this region, uh, their long-standing long relationship with country. I do this for two reasons. The first is civility, protocol, and respect. Um, and the second is to highlight a later point I want to make about networks, both visible and, and, and invisible, um, and who uh, and how networks privilege or exclude uh, certain groups. 
In brief, uh, I've got a couple of roles that I think I'm representing here and might bring uh, something to the conversation. My role in Melbourne, uh, which is, as you might know, is a research intensive institution located in the southeast of Australia and on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. My key work, noting I'm on sabbatical for a year at King's in London, is to move Melbourne from a pale imitation uh, of its forebears, the universities of Edinburgh, London, Oxford, to an institution which actually reflects its place in the world, and that means putting Indigenous at the centre. This encompasses all the elements of the university work, of course, student and staff uh, recruitment, but also things like procurement. Who do we buy from? We have several billion Australian dollars a year that we spend. How do we think about procurement in terms of the communities that we live and work and thinking about peace and justice and reconciliation in an Australian context? How do we think about those uh, even uh, procurement networks? How do we embed Indigenous knowledges and perspectives into our curriculum? Uh, just yesterday at Melbourne, uh, we ran interviews for the inaugural director of an Indigenous Knowledge Institute, an interdisciplinary research institute centrally funded by the university, uh, which, which we we're just establishing uh, to line up, hopefully, the, all the elements of the institution in an authentic way around Indigenous development. And clearly, that includes uh, knowledge systems that we've actively excluded from the academy for a long time, that is, Indigenous knowledges. And I'll come back to that briefly in a moment. We also do things like cultural immersion programs for all staff, which uh, include our most senior staff. I've spent four days uh, in the red dust in the north of Australia in a tent city with our vice chancellor, who uh, is ex-Cambridge, uh, and watching him understand things that he'd never seen before in terms of indigenous knowledge systems and how we would think about knowledge systems as our core work at a university. Uh, and how we need to think about them both as a value proposition but an important part of what we should be, what, what we should be doing. At Melbourne, essentially, the job's a relational job uh, and working with lots of people. The other role I have uh, relevant to this conversation uh, is to convene the Association of Commonwealth Universities Peace and Reconciliation Network. So a 500 plus university member network across the Commonwealth um, and I think the challenge with this work um, and, and this network is the breadth, uh, the breadth even of the concept of peace and reconciliation, which is so different in so many different places. The challenge to, under, to unpack the concept of the Commonwealth from empire, uh, and so those of us in the global south think very differently about the Commonwealth to perhaps people um, in London. Uh, and, and what the value proposition of those networks might actually be. I'll preempt just two uh, of the questions that we're having later, just to set a bit more context. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about is university society interactions. And I think that although, uh, and very much led in the UK, some of the conversations about engagement and civic engagement of universities, I think it's actually not enough. And I refer to, uh, I refer to kind of earlier comments about authentic internal system and structural change. And Carla touched on that a bit in her um, keynote address this morning, that that it needs to be deep change uh, in terms of institutions, and that's not that easy. And we need to think about engagement on whose terms. And instead of just talking about civic engagement, which is the way the university would like to engage with its surrounding and relevant communities, the real challenge to think about, actually, the very language of civic, um, and the kind of communities that we want to engage with and, and how they might like to engage uh, with us and Jennifer uh, commented on this yesterday about the appropriation or extraction of knowledge in a Māori context in New Zealand. My other uh, brief uh, comment before uh, passing on is uh, in Phil's opening comments yesterday, he talked about the fires in Australia and climate change was also mentioned this morning. What existing collaborations and networks have we got as, uh, in, in higher education? Uh, and importantly, what ones don't we have? Historically, as I've just said, indigenous knowledges have, in, have been excluded from the academy. But uh, for the first time that I've seen, and because the fires were so devastating, uh, there was quite a lot of reference in the media to indigenous knowledges that have managed fires on our country for millennia. Notwithstanding the, the, the changes from, from climate change, but actually the care for country as opposed to just the extraction of country. Now, we do this in a moment of crisis. 
but actually how might we think about our networks and our engagement with the Indigenous knowledge, uh, knowledge holders uh, in terms of ecological management, in terms of climate change, so that, as I said earlier, people that have been historically excluded from the academy and knowledges that have been historically excluded from the academy uh, become actually a core part of what we do, both in terms of civil society, uh, uh, broader engagement, and the purpose of universities in terms of contributing to, to um, communities to the grand challenges that we face uh, as a fading civilization. Mm -hmm. So, thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you. Shaman, yeah. Maria? Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, fraternal greeting for to all, special greetings to the directors and board of Deust University for this kind invitation. Uh, and thank you to everyone for your collaboration, patience, and commitment, which has brought me here. It is a joy to be here among you and with you, to learn and to share. To share. Um, I am Maria do Rosario Lopes Pereira Gonçalves. I born in the Republic of Cape Verde, an archipelago made up of 10 islands in the middle of the ocean, near from Senegal, but not in Senegal, um, a former colony of Portugal. So uh, a state just over 40, 40 years old. So it's normal that men here do not know my countries, but maybe if I mention Cesaria Evra, <laughs> Some of you might remember of recall hearing of it. Uh, I have a privilege, I had a privilege to come to Europe when I was young and I have 18 years to study, to be graduate in law. Uh, because in, the, in that time, in my countries, uh, we have no academy. It's been 20 years, 20 years ago, my countries have no academy, have no university. Because uh, the countries that colonize us was there for 500 years and they didn't build university for us. Mm -hmm. So because of that, university is very, very important to us. Mm -hmm. In Haven today, we have some university, but it's not uh, something uh, consolidated, strong as like uh, this university or the others. Mm -hmm. So we are going, going on. So, uh, I am lawyer, lawyer uh, judge as a professional, and since 2015, I have been the president of National Election, Electoral Commission, the highest body of electoral administration in my country. During my mandate as a CENI, uh, Electoral National Commission of Cape Verde, I was elected by my counterpart from the member countries of our sub-regions, the Economic Community of West Africa State, just ECOWAS, we can tell, ECOWAS. To share ECONEC is a, a, a network that brings together uh, the electoral administration of the 515 member countries of ECOWAS. And uh, in parallel, I also assumed the president's a share network of electoral bodies of Portuguese speakers. Mm -hmm. Countries, CPLP, mm -hmm. is mainly Portugal, Brazil, and the other countries in Africa. Uh, the two transnational institutions I present today all bring together the electoral authority 
have their common object objective, the consolidation of peace and democracy. We promote and holding of credible, peaceful, free and transparent election in each of member countries. Believe me, holding free and transparent, fair election is still a major challenge for our sub-regions. We still have member states that are debating with electoral conflicts, especially post-electoral conflicts. We have countries where peace, justice, dignity is not yet a reality for many people in the sub-regions. There are there social inequalities persist just today. And some countries, being a woman, is a disadvantage in many aspects of public and social life mm -hmm. until today. The question is, what do the university have to do with it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Maria. Huge. Dan? Well, thank you so much for the invitation uh, for our hosts, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be on such a distinguished panel. So uh, our work at uh, the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, uh, we have a, a motto, uh, think global, act global. And you'll see in some of our uh, research and policy projects how we combine a research uh, with uh, impact and we encourage our uh, colleagues and our students to think about how they can uh, reach out and interact at an international at a global level um, as a normal way of uh, doing business. Now, uh, there were a number of uh, intriguing questions posed uh, in the brochure and the invitation and for this session and what I'll try and do is to take a uh, an answer or intellectual frame to one of those uh, as a window into some of these impact cases that we've been working on. So I think one precept is that if we're in a uh, uh, quite a closed discourse, uh, one needs to look at um, uh, what are the pieces that don't fit. And as we look at uh, the UN and the a desire for peace and justice, the objectives of peace and justice, one of the things we came about across was that uh, at the time, um, officials, the public, the media, talked of the Second World War as um, being fought by the United Nations. And no, your ears do not deceive you. The United Nations have bridged the English Channel. On June the 6th, 1944, a date imperishably written in the annals of history by the armed forces of the United Nations, the fighting men of America, Canada, and Britain embarked on the greatest amphibious operation ever undertaken. More than four years of preparation had borne fruit. D-Day, prelude to the deliverance of Europe, came at last. Not the way I was ever taught in history, but uh, a large tale, um, hangs on that and many other uh, examples. I've been lecturing at United Nations on this, uh, read, helping them rediscover their own history and using this with NGOs who are looking to mark the 75th anniversary of the UN and it points to a far more realist origin of the United Nations than is commonly accepted. It's all uh, one of the aphorisms I would try and use in class is that uh, uh, it indicates how the United Nations is a realist necessity rather than a liberal accessory. Um, now, as we try to think and act globally, uh, we look, try and focus on what we really, really want. And it's interesting in this discussion that uh, the issue of planetary destruction 
of nuclear weapons and of militarism and major armed forces have not really featured. Uh, but if we focus on what we really, really want, um, we have a project um, which is supported by Oxfam International on realizing global disarmament. And we work with a number of uh, uh, international NGOs, local NGOs, increasing number of, of states, a uh, distinguished panel of expert former negotiators uh, and NGOs. And you can see in the, in the picture there, um, this is an aerial photograph of uh, previously nuclear bombers literally sawn into pieces um, to comply with arms control and disarmament agreements. And we have a project which takes this, this best practice and is introducing the long-standing non-aligned movement objective of general world disarmament. And this has been an issue which has fallen off the agenda and we're bringing it in uh, very much driven by the activism of our students who year on year have built these websites and developed this activity in, the, I would say, an extremely impressive way of demonstrating how uh, universities, students, and civil society can interact to move state policy. Um, I would say, though, this applies to disarmament, but many other issues, um, do not be put off. Um, in the area of, uh, uh, of peace, well, moving on to the issue of, of justice, um, we're engaged in uh, policies around the reform of the International Criminal Court, which, as you know, has a Nuremberg model of pr prosecuting uh, a dozen or a few very, very senior officials without having any process for the hundreds, thousands of lower level uh, perpetrators of war crimes. And in this study, we discovered a, uh, a secret archive of tens of thousands of World War II prosecutions that took us uh, about 10 years to uncover. And lo and behold, we found this is a sample uh, document from 1944 that Adolf Hitler himself had been indicted by 16 governments for war crimes in secret session um, long before the war came to an end. Many issues of uh, Holocaust related uh, topics came from this, but principally what has come is a model for uh, prosecuting war criminals, um, uh, providing assistance to states, um, having states take charges to the peer review of other states to see if they can sustain uh, a valid charge. And these were all forgotten practices from the 1940s. So we've been working with foreign ministries, uh, with the International Bar Association, uh, to take these uh, core uh, research findings into public policy and are now feeding into the review process on the, uh, of the International Criminal Court. And finally, um, I would say to all here, you can make a global difference. Uh, two of our students uh, did pioneering work, which ended up in a, uh, in a TEDx talk, uh, which I'll show you a couple of minutes of, if I might, um, where uh, they discovered that gender equality is only in the UN Charter because of the activities of Southern women from the Caribbean and Latin America. And here they are giving a TEDx talk they had, uh, I think, just graduated with their masters, so maybe uh, 23 years old, uh, when they gave this talk uh, a year or two ago. So we'll just watch a couple of minutes of them. And all wars. And the result of this conference gave birth to the UN Charter, the founding document of the organization that we are in today. So we have 160 delegates from all over the world gathered to sign the UN Charter. But only four were women, and only two of them, Berta Lutz and Minerva Bernardino, were specifically sent by the government to ensure that gender equality was included in the UN Charter. And can you believe it? No women were involved in writing the first draft of this charter. So women's rights were not mentioned at all. But when feminists had the chance to represent their countries at the conference, something remarkable happened. 
Speaking to an almost all-male audience, Berta argued for the inclusion of the word sex in the document. So it read that no country should discriminate based on sex. The British delegation thought that there was no need to include the word sex. But Berta diplomatically argued that would be a recognition of the wonderful work done by the British women during the war. And that's when the British had no option but to accept the inclusion of women's rights in the UN Charter. And actually, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, he also stood up at the conference and he said that the Latin American women at this conference deserve the thanks of Democrats everywhere because it is owing to their effort that we have Article 8 in the UN Charter. And Article 8, it was written by women delegates of Uruguay, Brazil, Dominican Republic, and Mexico. And this is what the article say. The United Nations shall place no restrictions on the eligibility of men and women to participate in any capacity and under conditions of equality in its principal and subsidiary organs. So the British and American thought we didn't need this article because women were not going to be excluded from participating in this organization anyway. But Bertha Lutz, she knew that we needed this place to be a place where women would be at the table. She said that there will never be an unbreakable peace in this world until women help to make it. And this is how we got Article 8 included in the Charter. Two years ago, when we started digging into the UN archives as part of our Masters in Diplomacy, we found out about the story of Berta Lutz and how we got gender equality included in the UN Charter. I can't tell you how surprised we were. She got so much resistance, and it didn't come from where we thought it would. In the documents we read, delegates said that they were bored and irritated by her long feminist speech. Berta Lutz got the nickname Lutzwaffe and was even called an extremist feminist. Some other delegates said that there was no need for this spectacular feminism. Well, as a result, the system-wide education of the UN system on the issue of UN women has been changed and rather than just focusing on Eleanor Roosevelt it now focuses also on the women of the global south and from their perspective people like Fatima it has been transformational in understanding uh, global feminism as something of the south not something of the uh, let us say the North American upper classes mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the North American upper classes told them at San Francisco not to ask for anything as vulgar. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the American female delegate um, at San Francisco. Okay. Don't ask for yeah. anything as vulgar as, as equality in the charter. Mm -hmm. So these are just a few examples of how out of classroom teaching, out of the work of research assist assistants and associates, we've taken issues, delved into them deeply, and then taken them on a it's quite a broad spectrum of issues into public policy debate. And as you say, this started for uh, Fatima and Elise in the classroom discussing, well, how did we get Articles 8 in the Charter? Okay. Thank you. Really interesting. Thank you very much, Dan. So, uh, there are, I think, some, uh, some connections among your interventions. And I don't know if you, if you want to comment in each in each, of, uh, in each of the others' uh, interventions, but I see one clear uh, connection among your intervention on how to facilitate the active participation of women and the need that you feel that the university have an active role on facilitating it. And I don't know which kind of experience do you have with the relationship with the uh, university that you have in your context, Maria, and how you are trying to act from the university, but on these issues. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the university is a key institution to make a global difference. Mm -hmm. If we want to improve women participation, we have to give the education 
of equality. We have to give powers to women. We have to give space for women. Uh, sometimes I think that uh, the concept of nation, United Nation, aspect to us uh, in our civil region concretely, yeah. the same level of engagement, the same commitment, the same level of good government, governance. But I think that it's very important to note it's not possible to have the same commitment in these issues mm -hmm. because really we are not at the same level. Mm -hmm. So we need different uh, perspectives for different regions. Women participation in my several regions is very, very critical and very, very complex. Mm -hmm. We have cultures issues. You know. We have uh, education issues. We have religion issues. Many things mm -hmm. uh, make a condition in with women participation. In our civil region in this moment, all member states, in all member states, women participation in political issues is not uh, 30%. No. It means the disequality is uh, high. It means we have we need a solution, but maybe the solution that United Nations present to us sometimes is not adequate for our reality, mm -hmm. because the, we, we had a different context. So we need solution, a specific solution for which countries. Even in my country, Cape Verde, to go to another country like Nigeria is not the same. The problem is different. Mm -hmm. So it means we to improve that. We need to invest in the first level. And the first level is education. Yeah, in the first level. Mm -hmm. Maybe in this, if we invest in this, in this level, maybe uh, we will have in future different, uh, different result. Uh, I want to note that today, in our super region, we have many companies from the other countries. We have uh, different institutions, governmental institutions from the other countries go there to work, to contribute in the developing is okay. We appreciate it. But we note that the universities don't go there. Why? Yeah. So yeah. I so think that we, yeah. mm. we, want, we need to change the way we, we are collaborating. It's true that uh, different universities in the world, in the world, many countries, give some us uh, some uh, place, and some people come to study and go back home, but most of them don't came, have have no this opportunity, but these people, my colleagues that have no opportunity to come to Europe. They are there. They are in the parliament. Yes, they are teachers. They are in the civil society. Yeah. How is it possible to have a strong institution as the United Nations uh, spread for us? For me, the institution don't exist is like a papers. 
institution is us, people, human beings. So if we want to make a difference, we have to invest in people. Today we have uh, technology. We don't need university, don't need to go necessarily physically to the other countries. Mm -hmm. If they want to collaborate, if they want to contribute more effectively, it is possible to find a different way. Okay. So, women participation in a crucial issues. We are working that. We work in the university. We want more women in the university mm -hmm. is coming. So, mm -hmm. but we have the others mm -hmm. issues. Okay. If mm -hmm. with education, maybe we can improve it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, so I think that there is here the challenge of how we can combine this global impact that have like United Nations uh, initiatives and so on, but taking into account the local context in which we need to have conditions if we want to have this impact, have a real impact on this local context. You are living the, the situation in which you, you, you feel that in your context you don't have the conditions to have a good impact of this kind of initiative. So how universities can combine this global impact but taking into account the local context in order to have also impact at the local level? Uh, to give a, a very personal opinion, yeah. I think that if you were an American graduate or British graduate of Harvard or Oxford, uh, you think you can operate globally because that's just your culture, yeah. entitlement. Yeah. And yeah. I think if yeah. we do nothing else as educators, it is to uh, provide our students with an equivalent maybe slightly more humble, sense of entitlement to operate globally. Mm -hmm. um, as a professor, when Elise and Fatima and other colleagues who moved on discovered this issue, I could have taken the glory, I could have gone to New York. Actually, Baroness Amos sent one email, I sent an email, I bought them two airline tickets and some youth hostels in New York, and they cleaned up because we gave them the courage and the power to do that. The other projects I mentioned, which having global impact, are run for maybe $20,000 a year, external funding. Yeah. Peanuts, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's because we have the concept to operate. Okay. So. I don't, and I guess I, in terms of my own political background, I'm something of a dissident within the UK system. Um, that I don't accept the idea that one should be constrained by where you are or you, you come from. Uh, it may be you want to work locally, and that's just fine. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think that as educators, we should yeah. uh, empower people's ambition. Yeah. Mm -hmm and empower people's will and strength. Um, and that, to my mind, is uh, one of my key missions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in that, uh, because one of the things we do uh, at Melbourne, one of the programs I run is that we bring 10 or thereabouts Aboriginal scholars to London for a week. Um, and it seems counterintuitive to bring Indigenous Australians to the brackets, dark, close brackets, heart of empire. But actually what happens, they first get to London and uh, mostly they describe themselves as a bit overwhelmed and with no agency and this, you know, these amazing buildings like the British Museum designed to make you feel insignificant. By the end of the week they want to, you know, take over the place and it's, it's about partly um, enabling agency but actually opening up networks uh, to, to people for whom those networks might not otherwise be easily available. It's why I kind of mentioned networks at the beginning. Uh, and I learned that um, uh, this university does a similar thing uh, in, in Latin American 
Indigenous leadership programs yeah. as well. So whilst they're still based, uh, still kind of run in some of those em empirical or empire patterns, the networks to power and the networks of, of influence uh, I think are really important to help provide access to uh, in a global context. Mm. Okay, yeah. If I, okay. A tiny note to that, yeah. it's the British Museum, not the Royal Museum. And that's part of English politics in its founding period when it was anti-royal at the time. And that carries forward into the way in which um, some of its leaders today conduct themselves internationally. And I would, to step back from that, I would say if you are looking to engage, look for who are the people like you, who are the, your natural allies uh, in the structures that you're looking to reach out to, then are all it isn't all you know a blanket hegemon. You know the empire isn't the empire. So the people who didn't like the empire always lived in London. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the allies. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maria. Thank you. I think that uh, the university. Uh, I think it's necessary to have more approximations and to have a new form of cooperation. Uh, so that will be allow universities uh, in developed countries to get more, more closer to the other university in the other countries. So to help them to produce knowledge uh, in, their, in their, their own countries. So if the uh, university from uh, developed countries go to the other countries uh, underdeveloped, so to promote indigenous uh, research, focus on the local reality if this university from uh, developed countries uh, share with the other yeah. university mm -hmm. that is uh, working in uh, environmental, environmental condition of poverty, if they share their knowledge and resource in the areas of knowledge which will be, a, their knowledge will be a heritage for mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. okay. Not a, a mm -hmm. only for this university, strong university from developed countries. If they share their knowledge, their resource will be for all. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, in this way, the university from developed countries would be contribu contributing to great, to improve mm -hmm. equality of opportunity in access to education among nations mm -hmm. and will be contributing to strong, more justice and uh, social peace. Mm -hmm. It is necessary it's very important is this new or the other's new way to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Because today we know the poverty have a consequence for all countries. We have illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. We have in this moment uh, issues like a refugees. Mm -hmm. It's mean the problems in the underdeveloped countries mm -hmm. will be also the problems in the developed countries. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's, it's more cheaper, it's more easier if the university or the government and the other institution to go there or to find a way to share to invest in education, in women, mm -hmm. in, 
children mm -hmm. to consolidate. Mm -hmm. okay. If people come, it's because it's not easy to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have a problem there. Yeah. Because of that, yeah. they come to yeah. look for something better for them. Yeah. Maybe it's better for this country, this government, the university to go there. Yeah. To yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maria. I want to know that. Yeah. I think one of the challenges with that is, I agree with you, but one of the challenges from an institutional perspective is uh, threefold: um, trust, purpose, and recognition. Yes. And I think uh, a bunch of so the, so on the trust uh, element. Uh, and thinking about civil society, how, do you, uh, how, how does previously excluded elements of society or previously excluded types of universities uh, get over uh, or, or engage with, not get over, um, the trust issues with, with big wealthy institutions who for a long time have gone and done what they've wanted in their own self-interest? Mm -hmm. How do those institutions then think about their purpose in a way which is uh, broader than just uh, research-led world impact rankings um, and ha how do they think about that in a way that they're going to get some reward and recognition for doing that if it's not implicit in their purpose. So I think there's some challenges in, in ex uh, uh, supporting the development of the breadth of different kind of universities, the diversity of the higher education sector, so that we can reward institutions and, and uh, recognise the kind of work that people are doing outside of, for example, biomedical health research uh, and the kind of things that you're talking about and the, and the support of peace and justice because they're harder things to measure, they're harder things to recognise um, and in that sense I think they're sometimes harder for universities to do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, changing the perspective, you mentioned, uh, Dan, that uh, we need uh, a deep transformation also inside the universities in order to have these challenges. And you, Maria, spoke about the new modes of collaboration yes. with the civil society, and you also then make refer uh, reference to this. So which kind of um, changes do you think that we need uh, to, to address inside the universities to, to have more, more this real impact on, the, on these challenges? Well, two things which we do in a, in a small way are developing free online study courses, uh, MOOCs on our particular topics, and also summer schools. So I'm doing a summer school on the United Nations and global advocacy uh, on some of the work I was showing you. So if people are interested in uh, engaging from civil society, understanding how to become more effective, mm -hmm. they can do that through means of a short course mm -hmm. with us. Uh, but I think more fundamentally though, there is a, a question of how far universities do see themselves committed to normative change mm -hmm. and how far actually they are representing social forces who aren't really interested or maybe are opposed to the, the de development goals um, and have a very different uh, social and political and economic agenda, as we all know so well. So these are internal political discussions mm -hmm. for universities. But I do think that amongst some of the social sciences, there is a, a huge structural problem, which is it's, it's like having a medical school that only teaches diagnosis, yeah? Um, because that is very much what a large part of the social sciences are like the international social sciences in particular. No treatment program. So you're producing doctors who, uh, uh, if, if asked to treat a patient, uh, will you know, try and either turn, a, turn a stethoscope into a bandage uh, because they have all the training of analysis, of finding out what the world's problems are, but nothing to say about uh, active uh, change for whatever reason. And in contrast, you have, let us say, uh, Masters of Business Administration, mm -hmm. which is entirely operational, with no uh, reflective um, intellectual side at all. 
And what we try to do is to combine the two, theory and practice. But I think there's a big problem in, as I say, in IR, other related disciplines, that they are really sort of stood back from what the skills of social engagement are. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a really, really big structural problem across uh, higher education. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Then, Maria. OK. Uh, civil society is also a key point mm. to transform. Mm. And I think, I don't, I'm not sure, but I have idea that the university, they are close. They look inside. Maybe if, uh, maybe because normally we think that the, only in the university we can learn. In the environment, university environment, we can we can learn. But I believe that uh, civil society is also an educational institution. Mm -hmm. Very, very important in forma, yeah. not as a university, it's in forma. Mm -hmm. But civil society is also an um, educational institution of great relevance because uh, it holds the knowledge, even if empirical, of social dynamics and reality. They have this knowledge. And which can be an asset for the university if the university open to do mm -hmm. to the civil society. I believe that if the university uh, is able to eliminate physical and uh, virtual barriers, mm -hmm. allowing the enter of a civil society, maybe we can have uh, university with more, with more social impact and social mm -hmm. relevance. Mm -hmm. It's true that the university is the best place to get knowledge, mm -hmm. scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I believe that if uh, university found a way to include mm -hmm. civil society inside mm -hmm. Even in the government governance, yeah. okay. in the university governance, mm -hmm. we can think a council, mm -hmm. consultative council mm -hmm. from university mm -hmm. when they can have the different uh, civil society representation mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. to participate. Mm -hmm. It maybe can help the university to have a program more realistic, with more impact, mm -hmm. social impact. Mm -hmm. And that will be important to guarantee the young people when they finish university, they will have space, they will have work, they will be in the market. But sometimes university offers uh, the programs, but when young people go, they don't, is not able to integrate. Mm -hmm. Maybe if the university have civil society that new can feel more mm -hmm. the dynamic, mm -hmm. social dynamic, maybe they will have programs more uh, realistic. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's possible to university to create organic link with civil society, organize mm -hmm. and other birds, in particularly consultative community. We can bring together the different structures that shape civil society some as an important to is an important way to explore. I think as of creating academic programs adapted to the communities targeting citizens who would otherwise, it's also a possibility. 
I believe that in partnership between different atos and institutions, it's possible to have a pedagog pedagogical project mm -hmm. for an, an undergrad course can be developed mm -hmm. with the other countries, for example. Mm -hmm. University here can develop it with institution in my countries, like uh, civil uh, society or institution governmental like uh, uh, um, ECONEC, mm -hmm. can create programs, mm -hmm. the graduate programs specific for this contest. Mm -hmm. This contest. Mm -hmm. I think is yes, uh, in this is we have uh, the university have a space to explore. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, th I think that takes brave leadership. Uh, and my example would be uh, a, a Melbourne example, sorry, but we have an Indigenous Elders reference group. Uh, it's basically garnish on the plate. It has no uh, constitution in the university's governance. If it tells the Vice Chancellor something, he is under no obligation to do anything about it from an Indigenous perspective. And I, I think you're absolutely right that it, it's actually an issue of governance, or, or can be, uh, amongst other things, an issue of governance uh, around engagement with um, civil society and brave leadership and thinking about different models of universities from our um, historically hierarchical models and finding different ways to get voices in that uh, aren't always opinions that the leadership wants to hear about the kind of things the university should do for the communities that it's in yeah. and the communities that it's serving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a very yeah. important yeah. issue. Yeah. Just to, uh, finish. to yeah. finish telling yeah. that, uh, ECONAC, yeah. our network for West Africa, we start to have a protocol of uh, Durst University for what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we believe it is possible yeah. mm -hmm. to bring this university to the member states mm -hmm. with a special programs, mm -hmm. with a special course. Mm -hmm. It's possible to, in, with this uh, protocol, we can join our, our university in, our, in all member states to join, to approximate yeah. for the Delta University to facilitate the approach and the sharing. Yeah. And I believe that if we have this, mm -hmm. we are doing an important step in the new way to collaborate. Yeah. Yes. The proposal, we mm -hmm. have to think about it. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. We have a uh, few minutes for uh, the audience. I don't know if you have any question. There is a huge experience of working also from, with different agents in different research groups here, I think. So, yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I teach at an all-girls school here in Bilbao. I'm also the director of MUN Bilbao and MUN Impact, where we um, are encouraging young people to be involved in the SDGs. My question to the panel is, do your universities collaborate with schools, with younger students, so that by the time they reach university, they already have a knowledge of the SDGs and maybe have been involved in projects? I'll give you a really short answer. Yes, not focused enough on the SDGs, and the challenge is, which is not a defensive comment, how far should the university sector extend its clause uh, both into the secondary and primary school uh, area and into other areas. I, I think it should be far, but I think it's partly the answer to your question. Yeah. Uh, through model United Nations engagement, so quite a bit few of us go and engage that way. Uh, otherwise, no. I mean, the university reaches out to uh, high schools in Greater London, uh, but really designed to recruit undergraduates. Uh, and if the SDGs are there, the motive is financial. Okay, Maria, do you want to add something? I just want to share uh, experience we have in my countries since 2017. Mm -hmm. 
with electoral commission from Cape Verde for, uh, with a public university. We have a programs, uh, we call these programs for uh, course, uh, uh, course de verão. Mm -hmm. It's mean uh, programs with one week. And on one week, we go to university, we bring young people yeah. that, are, that is not in the university. We bring them to the university, we find the other young people from the university. And during one week, we talk about, we learn and we share information about political and electoral participation. Because we have a problems with electoral and political participation with young people. So we, create, we have these programs. And uh, since 2070, with public univers uh, university and the others, we work with uh, 100, 1000 mm -hmm. young people. And we can tell today if that these young people have now the different uh, mentality. And I believe that in the next elections, this year, we will have more engagement and new different way to, uh, the, from young people with the electoral and political, the political issues. Mm -hmm. So it's an important way we found to engage and to motivate the young people is, is not in the university. They have the age to be, but impossibly, financially they are not. So we join them, we work then in the university environment with uh, professors, teachers in the university. So we share and we can see the difference. So I believe uh, we have uh, other way we can explore to engage and to include. I can say at the least in the, during this week, we can see the university is become an uh, open, inclusive uh, space. Mm -hmm. okay. Not uh, only for the university and the professors and teachers yeah. and the people. Yeah, yeah. So okay. they open the door, okay. it receives the others mm -hmm. and it share. Okay. It's important, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you. Yeah, thank you for your contribution. I think that it has been a very dynamic uh, conversation. And yeah, thank you for, to the audience for your attention. And now we are going to have a, a change in two minutes because we are going to receive our president, the president of the Basque Country, Inigo Urcullu, and uh, we are going to have the next presentation. Thank you very much to you.